I want to read uh, uh, John chapter 13, 1 through 4, and verse, then verses 18 through uh, uh, 30. And the reason I'm doing that is because this is at the, take, took place at the Passover. And in verses uh, 5 through uh, 17, Jesus is washing the disciples' feet, and that's another message for another time. Let us pray before we read the scriptures. Our Father, we, we are so thankful that we do have these scriptures, that you have taught us so much about yourself. You've revealed yourself and your Son and your Holy Spirit to us in ways that we can have a certain understanding, that we can appreciate our relationship with you and salvation that we have through you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 13, starting at verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had, had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper and laid aside his garments and taken a towel, he girded himself. We pick it up again after he washed the disciples' feet. Starting in verse 18, Jesus said, I do not speak of all of you, but I know the ones I have chosen. But it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. When Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. The disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know which one uh, he was speaking. There was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. So Simon Peter, Peter jested to him and said to him, tell us who it is of whom he is speaking. He, leaning back thus on Jesus' bosom, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus then answered, that is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. After the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Therefore Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Now one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. For some were supposing because Judas had the money box, that Jesus was saying to him, buy the things we have need of for the feast, or else that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. On this Palm Sunday, I want to focus on the one who betrayed Jesus, leading to his arrest and crucifixion. I prepared this uh, message, especially thinking of preparing us for this coming Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. As we know, Judas was named as a traitor by Jesus during their last Passover meal. Now, I want you to think of Jesus, of Judas, celebrating his last Passover. Can you picture Judas celebrating Passover every year with Jesus and the apostles? I want to speak on seeing Easter through the eyes of Judas or how Judas would have seen Easter. Now, before you say it, I already know Jesus did not experience Easter. He died before Jesus rose from the grave. But my thoughts on Judas this morning are confined to him at the Passover meal with the apostles and how he would have viewed Easter. In verse 18, 
just before Jesus predicted his betrayer, he started to prepare the apostles for what was coming. He said, the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. He quoted Psalm 41 in verse 9. Psalm 41 in verse 9 says, Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Psalm 41 was a psalm of David. In Psalm 41, David referred to Ahithophel betraying David and then committing suicide. In 2 Samuel chapter 15, in verse 12, it describes Ahithophel and referred to him as David's counselor and David's son Absalom conspiring against David. Then in 2 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 23, it says that when Ahithophel was exposed, he went out and strangled himself. Jesus quoted the story of David and Ahithophel to show the disciples that the traitor that he was going to name was a trusted and close friend of his and of them. He quoted Psalm 41, showing the apostles that just as David was betrayed by those he trusted, so was Jesus. This was to help set the stage for what it was that he was going to tell them. He knew it would take a lot to convince them of what it was that he was to say about one of the faithful 12. Each gospel account of the conversation between Jesus and his disciples at Passover, when, Judas, when Jesus named Judas as a traitor, there is no recorded reaction of any of the other 11 apostles regarding Judas. They said other things, but nothing about Judas. When Judas left the Passover meal, nothing was recorded where any of the 11 tried to stop him from leaving or to change what it was that he was going to do. It's plain in scripture that no one realized what this trusted apostle was about to do, even though Jesus told them. In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 1, at the Passover, Jesus was speaking to the apostles and he said, you will all fall away from me. You will all fall away because of me this night. So there he named all 12 as falling away that night. He knew what was coming. And he said that all of the apostles would turn from him in his hour of greatest need. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 14, the apostles were discussing who the traitor might be. Totally clueless. In, in uh, 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 John 13, 22, it says the disciples were at a loss to know which one was to be the traitor. In verse 26 of our text, Jesus, referring to the betrayer, said, This is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. When Jesus dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then in verse 27, after Judas took the morsel, it says, Satan entered into him, and Jesus said, What you are going to do, do quickly. Verse 39 refers to Judas as the one who kept the money bag for the apostles. Now the comment about the money bag was made after Jesus had exposed G Judas as the traitor. They didn't catch on to what he said anyway, but this is put in here, I believe, partly to remind us of how trustful Judas was. Even at the end of Jesus' three years of ministry, he appeared to be trustworthy to the apostles. Let's face it, within the church, 
the people that we assign to count the money and handle the funds are people that we trust 100%. If we had any doubts about them, we certainly wouldn't let them handle the funds. Too much temptation there. So Judas was much like the other 11 apostles. Throughout scripture, we read of their ups and downs and we read about their times of, of uh, doubts. At times, the various uh, apostles disappointed Jesus. But one thing they had in common as a group is that they were regular in their worship with Jesus. Not only did they travel with Jesus, but Jesus sent them out on mission trips together, and he assigned various other duties to the group of the apostles. Now, this is something that we all know, but perhaps we haven't thought it through. Judas was fully one of the 12 original apostles. He was chosen by Jesus Christ to be an apostle, just like the other 11. When the gospel writers would list the names of the apostles, when they would get to Judas, they would point out that uh, which Judas betrayed Jesus, so we wouldn't confuse him with another Judas. It was the apostle <clears throat> that was the betrayer. They said Judas, the son of Iscariot, because it would be so hard to believe that that man would be the traitor, so they would even identify which Judas it was, because that was a common name. The gospel writers wanted their audiences and us to know that it was an apostle that was the betrayer. Judas was so much like the others, he had to be pointed out as the traitor. In Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 12, it describes Matthias replacing Judas as an apostle. Then when you get down to verse 25, it says Matthias was to occupy this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside. Judas turned aside from the apostleship of Jesus. He was like the other 11. The difference is that he turned aside, rejected it. With this in our minds, I, uh, the explanation of Judas, I would like to deal with my original thought, how would Judas have seen Easter? Remember, he celebrated Passover with Jesus each year with the other apostles. He shared everything that they had. Judas would have seen Easter the same way some people in churches see Easter. He was not like one who shows up at church for Christmas, Easter, weddings, and funerals. He was consistent. He was just as consistent as the other 11 apostles. There was nothing to indicate that he would be the traitor. Judas, as one of the original 12, was like some people who attend church today. He looked and sounded like a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. We only find these people in church. Is it possible that there's somebody here who's like the ever-present Judas? Remember, Judas was a leader among the 12 apostles. We must examine ourselves from time to time. Do we look, act, and sound like we're a follower of Jesus Christ, but within us there's an element of hypocrisy? It took Jesus to expose Judas while they were observing Passover. The only one they can expose to Judas is the person themselves or Jesus Christ. We've probably all seen paintings showing Judas with his shifty appearance, probably bent over, uh, beady eyes, and one who wouldn't look you in the eye. When I was working on the notes for this message, I wrote down that Judas was like one of the proverbial wolf in sheep's clothing. 
And then I got to thinking about that. And it's good to think once in a while. It really is. Just stop and think. Listen to some of the descriptions of wolves among a flock. In Ezekiel chapter 22, in verse 27, it says, Her princes within her are like wolves tearing the prey, shedding blood, and destroying lives. Zephaniah 3.3 3 says, Her princes within her are roaring lions. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 7, in verse 15, says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. One last scripture, Acts chapter 20, in verse 29. At Paul wrote, After my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Did any of the apostles see Judas as a wolf or a lion or a traitor or as an evil person? Did Judas appear as a ravenous wolf tearing its prey, the flock? Did Judas, before his betrayal, remind them of a roaring lion? No, he didn't. They trusted him. He was not exposed until the Last Supper at Passover, and even when Jew Jesus named him as a traitor, they either didn't realize it, or they didn't accept it, or they just didn't understand what Jesus said about Judas. My friends, we have to be careful about who we put in leadership roles within our church. Everyone within our church affects us spiritually one way or another. You may not realize that, but every single one of you adds something to the Kirk Presbyterian. You do affect other people. We have to be careful about who we put into leadership positions. We can easily spot somebody who comes into the church and tries to cause divisions or to tear us apart. <clears throat> but not, but we can't recognize a Judas. The Buccaneers won the Super Bowl this year. Fans went out and bought Buccaneer t-shirts and hats and other mementos. If they sold t-shirts during the time of the apostles, <clears throat> How many Judas t-shirts would have been sold? Now we can smile, but I wonder how many. I wonder how many people put their faith in Judas rather than in Jesus. We do that a lot with people who are elevated in some fashion. If these people trusted in Judas rather than in Jesus Christ, they may have fallen also. Their focus was on an individual and not Jesus. And don't pick on them for looking up to Judas because all 12 would have appeared as to be of the same character. Today, my main concern in this message right now, my main concern is not about those who do not go to church on Easter. They don't care about the resurrection. They don't make any profession to. We should care about them. But right now, my message is aimed at us here within this church. Right now, let's worry about us who go to church as Judas did. That includes us. Judas worshipped with Jesus regularly, and he might have seen Easter as many of us see Easter. When I refer to Easter, I'm talking about Resurrection Sunday. He would not have seen Resurrection Sunday as non-Christians view it. If you always had Easter dinner with a family in Savannah for the last 23 years, and this year, they changed the time of the noon meal from 2 p.m. to 12 noon. Would you choose our Easter resurrection service over eating with the family? Be honest. Don't try to wiggle out 
of the, I've heard lots of wiggly answers before. Just be honest. Would you be with the family? Or would you be here worshiping on Resurrection Sunday? Where would you be, family or here? Now, I don't know Judas well enough to answer where he would have been, but it's clear that he would have seen attending worship as something that was better than many things, but perhaps not the ultimate thing. If you would forfeit a meal with family to be in church worshiping on Resurrection Sunday, you know how you view Easter. Knowing how you view Easter, Resurrection Sunday, and the worship is of first importance. Judas valued worship as better than some things, but not better than all things. Maybe he would have put worship ahead of family, because he certainly set a good example for everybody. You may be the closest person to Jesus on earth, or you may be a Judas with great attendance, maybe a teacher, maybe a prayer warrior. You may see Easter as better than most things, but not the ultimate thing. If you want to go home today in time to see a rerun of Duck Dynasty or Swamp People or the NCAA tournament, Please do not let anything that comes up on the television take anything off your focus on how you see Easter next week through your eyes. Don't worry about my eyes or anybody else's. Worry about yourself. Do you see Easter, as Judas saw it, better than most things, but not the ultimate thing? Now, if you do not come to church on Easter Sunday, that does not make you a Judas. But it does show you what comes first in your life. It shows you how you view Easter. How you view Easter is more important than how Judas would have viewed Easter. Now, I want to give you a good thought for Resurrection Sunday. I say this with a smile, but I'm very, very serious. Next week, get here 10 minutes before the worship service starts. There's many reasons for that, but let me give you two. First off, next week, we are going to have some first-time visitors. You can, if you are here, you can greet them. You can make them feel comfortable. You can let them know what kind of a church we are, and you can find some way to include them. You cannot do that if you come in late. Now, if you come in late, don't say, I'm late because I was praying for Kirk Church to grow. It doesn't work that way. You be here, and you greet people and you let them know what we are, because they may only go to church once a year, Easter, and you can reach out to that person, you can let them know what kind of a church we are, and who knows they might come back the next Sunday. They might even come back Sunday night. They might even put a little effort forward to make sure that they know a few people here, and that's going to bring them in. And you're talking to someone who goes to church once a, once a year for who knows why. But they have a reason. But see, you, made th you can make things connect for them. Secondly, if you are here before our worship service starts, I'm talking 10 minutes, you can be prepared to enter into the full worship of our church and not play catch up as the worship service progresses. The only way that you can get the full benefit of the worship is to be here when it starts. You come in later on, and I think it's hard to catch up. I do not come through those doors with a halo over my head because I'm so full of some kind of worship. It takes a little something to reach out to me. And if I'm late, I've missed that. 
you can be here early as uh, almost like as a missionary reaching out to people. And secondly, it benefits you as an individual in your worship. And we really, this is called a worship service. We come here to worship Jesus Christ. And worship doesn't always come automatic to all of us, easy at the same time. You have to put forth a little bit of effort. So next week, break the habit. Get here 10 minutes early. And you've got two benefits for doing that. Let us now close in prayer for how it is that we are going to worship and view Easter this coming Sabbath day. Let us pray. Lord, as we think about Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, and the worship of this resurrected Jesus, Father, let us focus in on how it is that we view the resurrection how we view worship, how we view outreach and the growth of our church. Father, don't give us any peace or any comfort until we conform to your standards. Father, help us in our personal worship and in our outreach to other people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.